Well, welcome to our 13th, it's hard to believe, I was in my mid-40s when these things started, and now let's not even say that the number six has hit, has hit the number. Um, welcome to the 13th Annual American Democracy Conference, sponsored by the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Uh, at this conference, we've tried to assemble many of America's top pollsters and journalists and party representatives and a wide range of behind-the-scenes strategists to discuss the upcoming election, whatever that election is, and of course, the big one is coming up in 2012. Lots of big ones. I do want to thank uh, Rick Shelby. Is Rick here today? Well, he'll hear about it if we, uh, thank God. Wonderful to see you, Bill. <laughs> they're, they're trickling in. Uh, Rick Shelby is Executive Vice President of Public Affairs for the American Gas Association, and uh, obviously he has given us this beautiful space, and I think the Capitol is out there someplace. Is it over there? I can't see it. Usually there's a great view of it, but uh, apparently for the cameras and so on, they want to keep that closed, unfortunately. But we're delighted to have the, the American Gas Association support and the use of their conference space for this, uh, this annual conference. Uh, we're uh, going to be looking, as I said, at all aspects of 2012, and we've got three good panels for you this afternoon. Uh, and uh, starting off uh, with this one, I'll introduce in a moment. At 2.45, we have our friend Eleanor Clift uh, leading a discussion about the Obama administration then and now. And then we want to make sure you stay around for our fourth and final panel, which is always useful because it's the insiders who are actually running these campaigns and know what's going on. We just talk about them. Uh, and we pretend to know what's going on. And some people, you know, Alex and Maria and Bill, they get insider tips. But um, it's useful to hear the insider's perspective, and that will be at 4 o'clock, and that panel will be run by Major Garrett, who uh, was the co-anchor of the uh, Saturday night's uh, debate there on CBS. So we're looking forward to having, having uh, him with us as well. So let me go ahead and introduce our panel, and I'm going to start here with Alex. Uh, you all know the name, if you haven't met Alex. I like to call him Alexander Burns because that's the way he signs his pieces. He's a reporter for Politico, was heavily involved in the election coverage in 2008. He's all over TV doing various and sundry shows there. He has a terrific background. Uh, tragically, he was not admitted at the University of Virginia, and he was forced to go to Harvard. Um, <laughs> and um, he assures me that Harvard was not his first choice. It was the University of Virginia. Now, he, en he edited the Harvard Political Review there, the publication at the Institute of politics. Uh, also, I have to say this, um, Alex did a fantastic job with Morning Score, which, and if you don't get this, you should get it. Now, he's passed it along to one of his colleagues with great regret because it causes you to stay up all night. It's the first thing you get in the morning. It comes in, and I've got to say, you had Morning Score coming in earlier than your successor does by about an hour, and you tell Jim I said that. I've noticed James uh, is, is sleeping later than you did, but poor Alex was up literally almost the whole night producing Morning Score. If you don't get Morning Score, it's free. You sign up for it at Politico, and it gives you a great summary of what's happened politically you know, in the last 12 or 24 hours, and has a lot of new information in it, a lot of exclusives, and uh, and I loved it because I, I tend to wake up at the crack of dawn. I can't go back to bed. I read Morning Score, and then I really can't go back to bed. You know, <laughs> it gets my blood moving for one reason or another. But he did a fantastic job with it and uh, now has uh, been able to be relieved of that responsibility. And as he says, he is now getting a full six hours of sleep every single night, which I think is terrific. And he's off doing other things with Politico, a lot of good coverage of the 2012 election. So Alex, we welcome you and we thank you for your great work over the years. Next to Alex is our dear friend Maria Cardona, who's done so many of these panels for us over the years, even when she wasn't as famous as she is now. She still came. She's been, as you know, you've seen her all over uh, television, uh, not just because she's a superb analyst and she knows Democratic Party politics so well, but because she just happened to know one of the, one of the four women uh, who uh, didn't quite get to know uh, Herman Cain. Uh, 
And uh, so she, she was speaking for her for a while. But in any event, uh, Maria is a seasoned Democratic strategist with more than 18 years of experience in politics and government, public relations, campaigns, you name it. She's currently a principal at the Dewey Square Group, where she heads the firm's public affairs practice, combining public policy, communications, coalition building, constituency outreach, government relations, and traditional as well as new media. Uh, she's, uh, as I mentioned, a frequent commentator. Uh, CNN uses her a great deal. MSNBC, Fox, all of them use her. And uh, most recently, Maria served as senior advisor to Hillary Clinton's campaign for president. I bet a lot of people have been coming up to you and saying, well, we really made a mistake in 2008. Apologies to the Obama people. I'm simply reporting what I'm hearing, too, from Democratic activists. So, right? It, isn't that true? You know, and it's always, it's always nice in life when, when, you know, you can basically say to people, I told you so, except you don't have to say it. They're allowing you to realize that you would have said it if they'd given you the opportunity. But uh, she is a graduate of Duke University. We beat you last week. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> but uh, Maria, it's a... Yeah, it's a, no, it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful university. Now, it's not up to the University of Virginia Standards, but it's a good, good university. Uh, just kidding. Now, Ed is not here. I'm going to introduce the panelists who are not here very briefly because they don't get their full introductions. But he is, he was, his plane was late, and he's coming in here. Ed uh, is a pollster, uh, president of C CEO of the Terrence Group, one of the most respected and successful Republican survey research uh, teams. He was uh, strategic counsel for the McCain presidential campaign, program director of the 2008 Republican convention. Uh, you know, he's worked for literally dozens and dozens of Republican governors and senators and 53 members of the U.S. House of Representatives, and the list goes on and on. He's uh, received all kinds of awards from the American Association of Political Consultants and, again, is all over TV. And he's one of the two pollsters who does the uh, battleground poll. That um, I th does, Is that Politico's? Or I can't remember. Yeah, I think that is Politico's. And so the one, George Washington University, uh, I believe... Uh, uh, the last week had Romney and Obama tied at 43, had some other interesting things that he'll probably discuss with us when he gets here. Now, to our good friend, Bill Schneider, uh, one of the great political analysts in America, no question about it. He is distinguished senior fellow and resident scholar at Third Way, and also the Omer L. and Nancy Hurst Professor of Public Policy at George Mason University in Washington, D.C. Omer Hurst was a state senator, a very prominent state senator from Virginia for many years. I knew Omer starting back in the, in the 70s, Bill. Uh, he was a great fellow. Uh, he, uh, Bill is, uh, as you know, was CNN senior political analyst for decades, and uh, many of you grew up listening to him and learning from him accurately about politics. He was a member of the CNN political team that was awarded an Emmy for 2006 election coverage and a Peabody for its 2008 coverage. And uh, Bill received a BA from Brandeis and got his PhD from Harvard. See, Alex, somebody got a higher degree from you, from, from, uh, from Harvard. Now, we don't have Juan Williams here. He's, come, he's coming. Uh, uh, I know he is coming. He said that he absolutely would come. He's, uh, you recognize him from Fox News. You may remember when he was with NPR, but I'm not getting into that. Uh, I think we'll just let that go. But he worked at the Washington Post for 23 years as an editorial writer, an op-ed columnist, White House correspondent, national correspondent. He's been the author of a number of books, such as Eyes on the Prize, America's Civil Rights Years, and most recently, uh, about that incident I wouldn't discuss, Muzzled, The Assault on Honest Debate. Uh, and uh, we will look forward to welcoming here when he help, well, welcoming him here when he gets here. Now, I want to open up with some questions, and we'll get to your questions once we have a chance to discuss a few things uh, as a panel. Now, the first thing I want to talk with the panel about are the three dominant political forces that seem to be driving politics in recent weeks. The the first force uh, you'll all recognize it's memory loss. The second is sexual harassment. And the third, I don't know, oops, I can't remember what the third one was. That was just, anyway, seriously, let, here's the real question. How do you, I want each of you for five minutes or so to tell us how you think this Republican race is shaping up. 
Uh, you've got, Juan, how are you? I just gave you a great introduction. It was almost as though you knew it was happening while you were walking in, so we appreciate that very much. I was thinking all those nice things about me, too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's good. Well, I hope I included all of them. You can let me know later. Uh, Juan, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody for about five minutes on how they think the Republican campaign for president is shaping up in a field uh, that that clearly hasn't shaken out. Uh, it's obvious that that the front runner just hasn't taken hold for lots of different reasons. And uh, Maria, as we were saying, this game of whack-a-mole continues. Uh, Republicans searching for somebody else other than Mitt Romney, and every time somebody manages to to rise above the fray, uh, we find out things that cause Republicans to dislike them, and down they go. Um, so we just want to get your overall impressions of the Republican race and, and um, any predictions uh, that you have about what might happen beginning in Iowa on January 3rd. Alex, I'm going to start with you. You cover this on a daily basis. Um, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Larry, and, and thanks to uh, all of you for, for being here on a, a rainy day in Washington. Um, you know, I think that, uh, as, as Larry alluded to, the shape of this uh, primary has been, uh, as uh, on one level, pretty consistent since last April that you have Mitt Romney uh, staying steady in the 20 to 25 percent range, uh, and somebody else at any given moment also in the 20 to 25 percent range, but what has varied is who that person is. We forget that this actually started with Donald Trump uh, when he was pretending to run for president. Uh, maybe actually thinking about running for president. Um, since then, we've had this sort of boom and bust cycle. Uh, and I think if looked at, look, looking at it from one angle, you can see this primary as a choice between Romney and the anti-Romney, and we don't know who the anti-Romney is. Um, I would offer a competing angle that's not uh, not contrary to that one, they can exist together, but I think you can also view the primary, certainly at this point, as sort of a Mitt Romney competing against himself. Uh, that at this point, Republicans who are not crazy about, about Mitt have sort of run through their list of options. Uh, we're down to Newt Gingrich now, uh, which we'll see how long that lasts. Um, and with, we're, we're seven weeks out from Iowa, and I think the question is, you know, will Mitt Romney finally be able to do something to connect with the conservative base that lifts his numbers a little bit higher. Uh, is that 25% number uh, a ceiling? Is this as good as it gets for him? Or is that, uh, as one of my colleagues at Politico suggested last night, uh, is that a floor for him? Is that, the, is, is that as bad as it gets for him? If his numbers don't go below that, then maybe when people start voting, they will start to see him in a different way. He will start to uh, actually rack up some votes, and people will begin to realize, well, this guy can actually win things, and we want to win something pretty big in November. Uh, maybe this is our guy. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but we've been certainly looking over this last week at the, at the possibility that Newt Gingrich is a plausible presidential candidate. Um, I, I, I will... I'm very curious to hear what my fellow panelists, including uh, uh, one in particular who, who would have worked with Gingrich uh, most closely, uh, has to say about that. But, you know, I think the assumption right now is that Mitt Romney will be the nominee simply because <clears throat> there is nobody else, uh, that he can lose Iowa, but it, it almost doesn't matter who wins Iowa if Romney then wins New Hampshire and then nobody else can beat him in South Carolina, Florida, uh, and beyond. Um, and the one nagging doubt about that is, what if Romney is even more unacceptable to Republicans than, than we all realize? You know, what if we are in sort of a game of musical chairs and uh, whoever is sitting in the anti-Romney chair when the music stops is uh, our next president? So I'll leave you with that reassuring thought. Uh, <laughs> good. Thank you, Alex. And that's a good introduction to our, our subject. Maria. So I agree with most of, of what Alex mentioned. I do want to add one to what Larry uh, talked about in terms of what is what are the factors that are contributing, thank you, what are the factors that are contributing to how this race is shaping up? And I would say that a big factor 
in all of the sort of what I love to call, and I've mentioned this on TV, the Republican GOP whack-a-mole process, because it's exactly what Larry talked about. You have Romney, people are not enamored with Romney, conservatives are not enamored with Romney, and they are looking for the alternative. And we have seen, I think, every sing almost every single person right now who's running for president, except for John Huntsman, because he's way too moderate, um, rise as sort of the anti-Romney, and we've seen them being whacked down for one reason or another. But I think one reason for that is because <clears throat> of the ideological force of the Tea Party, and the way that the Tea Party has really inserted itself in how the GOP field is shaping up. And, and, and what I mean by that is that and you've seen this from analysts from, from left to right, that this is a GOP field that is as right as we have seen in many, many years. And in fact, you talk about how a lot of analysts have talked about that Ronald Reagan could not be nominated in today's GOP environment because he is not conservative enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is very ironic because you see the Republican candidates, one after the other, pay homage to Ronald Reagan, when in fact, if they really look at his record and, and if they actually talked about what he did, he would be run out of today's Republican Party. Um, so I think that the, the Tea Party really has an effect, has had an effect on how this whole GOP field has been shaping up and why Romney and the reason that there is, I think, this whole movement of anybody but Romney and Romney running against himself is because Romney is a moderate, but he knows he can't win as a moderate. And so what happens? He has now flip-flopped on every major political issue that he has ever stood on. And, and so conservatives sort of see that and they don't trust it with good reason, because how are you going to trust somebody who, who for purely politi political reasons, is going to do a 180, n not a nuanced shift, because that's fine. People do that. People grow. People evolve in, the, in their political leanings and their political beliefs. This is not a nuanced shift. It, it is a 180 flip-flop. And that's why I, th that, that I think is one of the biggest reasons why he is vulnerable and why conservatives do not trust him and they are looking for the anybody but Romney. And it's interesting because now it's Gingrich's turn. And, and again, what you see from Gingrich, frankly, from my view, is that he is also quite moderate. In, in as you com as compared to the current GOP field. One of the reasons why his campaign floundered at the very beginning is because during a um, Meet the Press interview, he actually attacked Paul Ryan's economic plan as being way too extreme. And then I think, you know, that was a rare moment of honesty of the true Newt Gingrich. And, and the man is smarter than anybody else on that uh, in that field. As he will tell you. As he will tell you. <laughs> exactly. Time and again. Uh, but at least, you know, he has the record and the ideas to prove it, right? Um, but so you sort of are seeing him also sort of compete against himself because he is a lot more moderate. And for me to say that it, it is saying a lot. So uh, I think that it's going to be very interesting what happens from here on out. It has been so bizarre the way that candidates have risen and then fallen and you know, far be it from any of us on this dais to ever predict what voters are going to do because voters will do what they want to do and none of us are smarter than the voters. So all I can say is that for me as a Democrat, it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you're having a good time, Maria. Absolutely. Thank you. And in, in, your ab in absentia, I gave you a full introduction with, okay. with high praise <laughs> and we appreciate enormously your being with us today. And of course, as Alex okay. mentioned, you uh, you know uh, Speaker Gingrich rather well, and of course, uh, having worked for dozens and dozens of Republican officials, you've got a great feel for this presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. If you can give us an overview, what you think is happening and will happen presidentially. Well, it seems the focus is on the Republican primary, which is... Uh, yes, we're, we're, but we'll get to the general election. The yeah. Democrats right. would like, like right. to have it, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so I'm having uh, so much fun. You know, I, well, ha have your fun because it's probably going to be the last of your fun in this election. <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I, I always love kind of going back and, and the, the revisionist history, if you will, of uh, romanticizing Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a, was certainly a great president uh, from from my viewpoint, um, but presidents only get lightning in the bottle once. 
They don't get it in both elections. And Reagan didn't have it in 1980. The reality of Ronald Reagan is he was portrayed as being ultra conservative, socially conservative, not smart, B-rate actor. Mm, that's true. Um, he helped with a few comments like, I'm not going to worry about the deficit. It's big enough to take care of itself. Um, more pollution, more pollution <coughs> is more pollution is caused by trees than by people. Um, and five out of six news stories that came out during that election from the time he announced to the election were were negative about Ronald Reagan. The difference was is that five out of six stories about Jimmy Carter were also negative. Um, so kind of focusing just on the Republicans and where they are today uh, is, is not really indicative of where this race is and where this race is going. Um, the other thing that we know, those of us that work in, in, in politics and presidential politics all the way through, is that the eventual nominee never looks like the person going into the process. And right now, not one vote has been cat cast yet in this process. The kind of knee-jerk back and forth on various candidates have occurred for really two reasons. One is there's been 10 debates. And second, the campaigns are trying not to spend any money because sometimes we run the last campaign. And the, the example of the last campaign was Rudy Giuliani, who was ahead in all the polls. I was doing his polling, trying to convince him the polls didn't mean anything, so don't take it for, uh, to, to, to heart. And watching him spend a tremendous amount of money by this point in the campaign. And so what has happened is as they've tried to not spend money in this campaign, uh, the debates have become that much more predominant. In, ter in terms of, of, of the attention level. Now, the ceiling um, on, on, on uh, Mitt Romney, and I think I was one of the first ones out there to kind of call attention to the ceiling, the early ceiling that I saw for Mitt Romney, was not because of any image of him not being conservative enough, was not because of any image of him flip-flopping, was not because of Mormonism. It was because Republicans had been somewhat revisionist again in their history and feeling that in 2008 they picked the next person in line that did not turn out very well and they're not going to pick the next person in line this time or at least they were going to be resistant to it that's where the early ceiling came from Mitt Romney now where is he today um, I actually thought he was going to break through that. Uh, uh, he gets a great deal of credit by almost all circles in the Republican Party for his debate performances. He gets very high credit for the campaign that he has run, and I'm not involved in that campaign. Um, I actually thought the true <coughs> test of his campaign was when Perry shot way ahead of him in terms of the polling, and he didn't push the panic button. He handled it. At kind of in stride. And I thought that would finally be the opportunity for him to prove to voters he's not the next one in line, he's earned their support. I think that time is still coming. Um, but what was interesting about, we released a battleground poll this week with Politico. Uh, there was a couple of interesting things in the poll. First of all, we asked first and second choice. And he was running about 25%. Uh, it was kind of before Cain started to decline, Gingrich was first uh, was starting to come up. But 25% of the vote, kind of that ceiling that everyone sees him getting. But on second choice, it was another 20%. He is the only candidate with a combined first and second mention is in his 40s. Interestingly enough, kind of predictive of the next person coming up, was Newt Gingrich was in, was in the low 30s. Cain was in the 20s. And so that is a fairly good predictor of, number one, that that ceiling is, is actually more of a floor than a ceiling. The second thing we asked was, who do you believe is going to win the nomination? 48% said Romney, again in that mid-40, high-40s range. Um, if you looked at Newt, who everyone's talking about being the next person to, uh, to get the nomination, he was only at 3%. Even with the surge he was showing in the numbers, he was only at 3%. Kane was in the low 20s, uh, and Perry was in the, in the uh, uh, mid-single digits, about 6 7%. Um, again, indicative that there's kind of a ceiling there that is more in the 40% range, as opposed to what's been ta talked about in the 20% range. So I think the race, uh, I think the, the one one dilemma that, that, that uh, Romney has at this point is he's actually in a position to do extremely well in Iowa. 
uh, as these campaigns have not spent the, spent the traditional money, you are not seeing the organization in Iowa from a Newt, from a Kane, from even a Perry. Um, in fact, one, the one surprise kind of sitting there is the one person that's been organizing the state for four years very strongly and has a group of voters that he may be at 10%, but it's a strong 10% and that's Ron Paul. Um, so there may be an opportunity that if Paul ends up winning Iowa, all of a sudden everyone's going to say Iowa doesn't matter. And then you move to the next state, which is New Hampshire. I think the dilemma that, that, uh, that Romney has at this point is how do you make the effort to win in Iowa without looking like you're making the effort to win in Iowa? If he comes in a strong first or a strong second, um, all of a sudden this race will shift very quickly to Romney with New Hampshire. Uh, if he doesn't, uh, then it's going to be a more, more prolonged fight. But he still has this dilemma of how do I go after Iowa but without looking like I'm going after Iowa. And I will tell you, the one thing I, I kind of walked away from focus groups in Iowa, kind of understanding, is their belief in Iowa is that if they haven't met a candidate at least three times, then something's wrong with the campaign. I mean, that's the mentality of the Iowa caucus goers. And so winning it without looking like he's trying to win it is going to be kind of a, a long stretch. But anyway, should, that's should how I skip it. it. Should he just skip it? Well, no. I, I think he's done everything he can to basically look like he's not going after it hard. But again, if you look at most of the Iowa polls, the, the real credible ones that are really getting down to the caucus goers, he's holding in that mid-20 range that you take off a Ron Paul doing well, and then you have the others that are competing with the rest of the vote, he could be right in there, first, second, uh, very close second place. But if he finishes third, you know, he was suckered in. You know, the la well, he wasn't suckered yeah. in. He went all out, right. and, then, and then, you know, we know what happened. He did very poorly, or relatively poorly, and then that helped to bring him down in New Hampshire and ruined his campaign. If, if, Once if, burned, twice shy. Uh, yeah, and, and if he made a strong play at the last minute and came in a distant third like he did last time, um, he would be in trouble. Basically, exactly. everything he has done in the last year would be thrown out the window. Right. So you can see what's going through Romney's mind and understand why he's making the decision he's making. All right. Uh, thank you, Ed. Bill Schneider. There is an old Chinese proverb. It says, if you sit by the river long enough, sooner or later, all of your enemies will come floating by one by one. <laughs> Mitt Romney is sitting by the river. There goes Tim Pawlenty, Chris Christie, Michelle Bachman, Donald Trump, Mitch Daniels, Haley Barber, ooh, Rick Perry, and soon Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich. He's sitting by the river. It's a very smart campaign strategy. Uh, if the Republicans nominate Cain or Gingrich, they are just asking for trouble. And I think they know that. Uh, they come with enormous amounts of baggage. Uh, by the way, I do think that in, in, if Barack Obama were not who he is, he would have a progressive challenger in the Democratic primaries. The reason he has no progressive challenger in the Democratic primaries is that he's African American. And any progressive candidate who dared to challenge Obama in the Democratic primary would immediately offend large numbers of African American voters, and that is not the path to success in the Democratic Party. We are in this stage of the campaign called the invisible primary. Uh, nobody casts a vote, but there is a winner. Usually the winner goes on to get the nomination. It's whoever is first in the polls and has raised the most money. But there are times when that doesn't happen. Howard Dean won the invisible primary at the end of 2003. He had the most money. He was on top of the polls. Three things happened that killed Howard Dean, and the last one, which was after Iowa, was the scream. The first one was that he was found to have insulted the voters of Iowa in a radio broadcast some years before in Montreal, Canada, by saying he didn't think the Iowa caucuses should count because they're not a real exercise in democracy, and he was right. But <laughs> Iowa voters take themselves very seriously. <laughs> the second was that John Kerry, uh, by, just by chance, a former veteran who said that Kerry saved his life, showed up in Iowa, and there was a dramatic moment when he and Kerry embraced, and Kerry suddenly came on the scene as a great war hero. The scream, which eliminated Dean, happened the night he lost the Iowa caucuses. Um, what we're talking about here with Romney and Iowa, and I was not, it is not a real exercise in democracy, folks. A caucus is a meeting. A primary is an election. 
Very, very different. A meeting is public voting. You have to get up on a freezing winter night and go to somebody's living room and stand up in front of your friends and your neighbors and God and everybody and proclaim that you are a Michelle Bachman supporter or something. It's public voting. Normal people don't want to do that. <laughs> it's only people who are very well organized or who are driven by churches or the Democratic Party, by labor unions, who can get organized and they go and they do that. And it takes hours. And it takes hours. Uh, remember that. A primary is an election, a caucus is a meeting. It shouldn't count. Dean was right. Romney's problem is he's got to try to manipulate expectations. I always say in any election, there's an invisible candidate whose name is expected. It's not enough to win. You have to do better than expected. Even if you win, if you do worse than expected, you lose. Uh, Romney has to be very careful not to raise expectations because he doesn't want to come, come out of this as he did last time, doing worse than expected. Who sets the expectations? We do, especially Larry. He has a newsletter. <laughs> That's what the talking heads and the commentators and the people who go on television and those of us who write columns, that's what we do. In 1998, uh, at CNN, that was a midterm election, I canvassed just before the election about 50 talking heads. And I said, what do you expect to happen in the election a few days from now? And it was kind of a waste of time because they all said the same thing. Clinton was facing impeachment. We all knew that no president's party since 1934 had ever gained seats in a midterm election in the House of Representatives. So everybody said the same thing because we live in a bubble. We said, everyone said, uh, the Democrats are going to gain between five and ten House seats. I announced that at the beginning of the evening. I said, ladies and gentlemen, here is what's expected to happen. I can officially say. I don't know if Larry's newsletter was around then, but the, everyone I spoke Thank to God said, it, it was not. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> said, <laughs> <laughs> everyone said the same thing. Uh, and at the end of the evening, I said, I'll be back and I'll let you know if the Democrats have done better than expected or worse than expected or about as well as expected. <coughs> Lo and behold, the Democrats gained five seats, something that had not happened since 1934. So somewhere around 2.30 in the morning, uh, I was able to announce officially that the Democrats had done better than expected. And what happened? Lo and behold, the next day, Newt Gingrich resigned as Speaker of the House. That's what expectations can do. Oh, those are those are marvelous um, uh, stories and and reminders for us, Bill. And uh, the same thing will happen this year. Whatever, all the expectations will not come to be. The, of that, we we are certain. Juan. Uh, well, thank you. I, I was listening and learning. I, I was listening and learning. I think this is an excellent panel, very well informed. I would say, from my perspective, the one thing that we haven't touched on is the internal. War, if you will, that's a little bit of hype, but why not? Uh, in terms of establishment GOP versus Tea Party GOP, this is not the primary process that establishment Republicans wanted. These are not the candidates that establishment Republicans want. Uh, and if you look at these candidates, you would have to make the judgment that people who would have been the strongest Republican challengers to President Obama have decided to stay on the sidelines. And yesterday there was an indication possibly of why when Chris Christie said, any Republican who thinks this is going to be a cakewalk is sadly mistaken. This is a president who's going to have more than a billion dollars. He's going to have the bully pulpit uh, of the White House and the presidency. He has a long established campaign organization that's already in gear. Essentially, he's out campaigning right now. And he has some very strong and aggressive strategists uh, working for him, and Axelrod, Pluff, and the like. And he has the advantage, of course, of a long established base. Ed touched on it in terms of African Americans, but you look at the Hispanic vote right now, especially in the aftermath of Republican attitudes revealed during the debates on immigration. Uh, uh, you know, you can have lots of complaints if you're Hispanic about President Obama, but it's nowhere close to the complaints and alienation you would feel from the Republican Party at this juncture. So you can imagine then he's got the black vote, the Hispanic vote, 
Gabe's are quite thrilled at what happened in terms of don't ask, don't tell. And then you move from there and you start looking around and you think, well, what is it that would present a huge challenge uh, to the base, maybe the XL pipeline? I don't know, we'll see. But he's got the unions, of course, especially given what just so happened in Ohio uh, with Kasich and what's happening with the recall in Wisconsin with Walker. So the unions, for all of their laments about President Obama, are in line. And then to go back to one other thing that Ed touched on, well, what about people who are upset that President Obama has failed uh, to close Guantanamo Bay, pursued so many of President Bush's policies in the war on terror, used drones uh, willy-nilly in some cases, killed American citizens with the drones in terms of al um, And the answer is no Russ Feingold. Uh, Ed thinks it's because of race. I think it's because, in fact, it would be seen in the aftermath of Ralph Nader as a sort of a, a waste of time. And it would simply be weakening the Democrat in the face of a very unpleasant option, which is, to go back to my starting point, this cast of nominees on the Republican side. The evidence of the establishment, GOP establishment disillusionment with this group, I think is obvious if you look at people like Mitch Daniels, who would have been a very strong candidate. Haley Barber, who would, I don't know if he would have been a very strong candidate, but he is certainly an experienced political pro, much admired by the Republican establishment. Number one would have been Chris Christie, who is sort of the golden boy of the Republican establishment. Um, on all these, in all these ways, you have the sense that President Bush, Karl Rove, people who are driving the big money on the Republican side are still in search of someone that they can feel absolutely comfortable with. They are not comfortable with Romney. But after Christie declined to run, what you saw was a rush of money, especially Wall Street money, into Mitt Romney's coffers. And I think that that's, I, I agree totally with the numbers that I've seen would suggest that if you ask people who's your second choice, it's Mitt Romney. If you ask people who's going to win this thing, it's not only uh, the wise guy consensus of these pundits at the table, it's the consensus of Republicans. Mitt Romney's going to be your nominee. But that presents a tremendous problem, and it's not just what Maria was talking about in terms of flip-flops. It's a huge problem if you think, well, the animating force behind the Tea Party was anger over President Obama's signature piece of legislation, the Health Care Reform or Affordable Care Act, derisively referred to by Republicans as Obamacare. Well, how exactly is Mitt Romney going to attack Barack Obama on a health care legislation plan requiring individuals to purchase insurance. It almost doesn't matter what the Supreme Court decides. President Obama versus Mitt Romney, they're both in the same boat. That's a problem for Tea Party advocates. On their signal issue, Barack Obama's signal issue, the likely Republican nominee is neutered. That's a big problem. So in all of these ways, what you see is the Republican establishment not enthused, not fully engaged as yet. I get the impression from some on the panel that, oh, just wait, they're coming in because they all hate Obama so much. And that will be the animating force. It will be hatred of this Muslim, non-born American, uh, whatever else, socialist, I'm sorry, I forgot, thank you. Uh, and it will be hatred of Obama that will animate Republicans, that will cause them to coalesce and discover the virtues of whomever the candidate might be. But at that juncture, you really have to ask, uh, you know, is it sufficient? Uh, yes, hatred, hatred and fear are great political motivators, but at some point, 
you do have to feel as if you are standing for something. And I think that's what would be missing in this picture. So uh, obviously we're talking here on November 16th. And the one thing I would say to you uh, along the lines of what Dr. Sabato had to say about his newsletter, most likely we're very wrong. <laughs> he who lives by the crystal ball ends up eating ground glass. There you go. That's our motto. Uh, but it seems to me, Juan, maybe with your exception, and Alex is a reporter. He can, he's a just the facts man reporter. He can't be declaring nominees. He reports what is happening. But um, it seems to me this panel set the expectations, if you're listening carefully to them. They have nominated Mitt Romney. I'm sorry. They have nominated Mitt Romney as a group. So they haven't told us whether he's going to win it quickly or whether it's going to take a while, because it's difficult to know what's going to, whether Iowa's going to be a muddle or somebody's going to come up and nobody knows what's going to happen in South Carolina. Uh, Romney has a big lead in New Hampshire and, and probably very substantial advantages in, in uh, Florida as well. And then Flor uh, February's dead, and then you move on to Super Tuesday in the beginning of March, and, and that's where the organization and money for Romney really come into play. So you've all nominated Mitt Romney. So the next question, obviously, for this expectation-setting panel is who he should nominate for vice president. Who do you think he will nominate? Who should he nominate to be his vice president to give him the best chance of moving into the general election as at least an even bet? Who would like, I'm not going to go down the line. Well, wait a second, it. wait a second. But no, the, the answer is so obvious. Why do you, why do you pester these people? <laughs> Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin. I'm <laughs> Okay, one vote for Sarah Palin. <laughs> now let's get serious. Who else wants to? Uh, well, I think, you know what, he's got it, to my mind, just in the way that McCain was trying to push the party forward, and in his case, I think, use Sarah Palin to attract women that he thought were disaffected by Obama's lack of selection of Hillary Clinton. I think that if Romney was trying to push the party forward, he would pick someone like Nikki Haley, a, a woman, a minority, or um, Martinez, the governor of New Mexico, especially to appeal to the Hispanic vote. Um, it may be, though, that he has to go to the other extreme, which is the Sarah Palin extreme, which is that he has to pick someone who would appeal to Tea Party sensibilities. And maybe then you could do things like um, also look at critical states. You could look at Ohio and say Rob Portman. Uh, I think that's why Portman gets so much talk. Of course, I didn't mention uh, the Florida senator whose name I'm blocking Marco Rubio. 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 But Rubio would fit in the same Nikki Haley Martinez axis. All right. Bill. Um, the, uh, Rubio is both Tea Party and Latino, although he's not Mexican American, he's Cuban American. And trust me, Mexican Americans know the difference. Uh, he would be an interesting addition. Uh, he may have some baggage, but we don't know all of that yet. Uh, I will give you the Schneider rule for choosing a vice president. Write this down. When you there are 10 reasons why you pick a vice president. Reason number one, pick someone who will help you win. The other nine reasons don't matter. <laughs> when it comes time, he's going to pick whoever will help him win. Right now, that looks like Rubio because it would be a twofer. He would have a Hispanic candidate. He would have someone who appeals to the Tea Party. But there's a lot about Marco Rubio we may not know yet. And you weren't impressed by that article in the Washington Post about his uh, parents may maybe not filling the category of uh, of the exiles from from Cuba did that bother you at all bill uh, they tried to go back to Cuba that's that's a debatable point he did misrepresent how his parent when his parents came here uh, he argues that they tried to go back to Cuba they were unable to do it so that he defines them as exiles. That's an important difference, by the way, because Cuban immigrants have a totally different status from Mexican immigrants. There are no illegal Cuban, Cuban immigrants. Um, we have a wet foot, dry foot policy. If a Cuban immigrant sets foot on, in the United States, they're automatically uh, admitted to this country. They're legal and they can become a citizen. Mexicans do not have that privilege. Uh, I think that is a debate. They'll, we will have that debate. I'm not sure it's totally disabling. All right, Ed and, and Maria and Alex, I have to hear your nominees for vice president for your nominee, Mitt Romney. 
Well, I think I think Rubio is going to be an obvious choice um, to to kind of look at for a variety of different reasons. I actually think he came out of the whole story looking fairly well. Uh, how how he responded to the story. I mean, cer certainly uh, the the bulk of the people out there, their response was very positive, and and that kind of disappeared after that point. Um, I think in terms of uh, Portman, um, I think he might have been an interesting choice, uh, but I think with being on the super committee, that pretty yeah. much uh, nixes. <laughs> Uh, him as a possibility. I, I think the one person to look at is the governor of, governor of Virginia. Um, I think he has a very good record in terms of the economy. Um, I think he brings in a lot of the establishment Republicans uh, from the conservative end that are not necessarily there uh, for Romney. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, I think it has a solidifying factor. Um, he has uh, ex-military background that would come into play some on the foreign offense, uh, foreign defense uh, issues. Um, so I, th I think he may be kind of the sleeper to watch uh, out there. He doesn't get mentioned a lot. Um, he but mentions himself quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Virginia, but not nationally necessarily. Um, so I, I think that's going to be very interesting. I do have to say something about the Tea Party, tea party movement. Um, I, I, I think you can tell the difference between those people that understand the Tea Party movement and those people that call it the Tea Party, um, uh, which in fact it is not a party, it is a movement. Um, and if you look at the polling numbers, uh, we have tracked fairly consistently um, that it's about 40% of the electorate are favorable towards the Tea Party. Since there's not a membership, the only way to kind of look at it is favorability towards the Tea Party. And if you look at that, it's 85% Republican, 10% Democrat, and a 5% Democrat and 10% independent. Um, so yes, they have some issues they're focused on, but in their core, uh, while they're putting certain issues as a priority right now, in their core, they're Republicans. And, and I think you'll see that kind of come back into play in a very big way in the general election when that's the choice they have, a Republican and a Democrat. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of overstatement in terms of the Tea Party. Um, are they playing a role right now uh, in terms of the activist of the, of the Tea Party movement speaking out and saying different things? Yes. Um, am I seeing the actual, the, 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 the broader scope of the Tea Party movement reacting any differently than the Republicans uh, in terms of what's going on in the presidential nomination process right now? Absolutely not. Maria, uh, Alex, any other nominees for vice president for so Mitt Romney? I, I actually agree with Ed that I do think Bob McDonald's going to be somebody on <clears throat> the very short list. But I do have to... Thank you. I do have to say something about Marco Rubio because I know that his name has been mentioned many, many times. Um, and, and even if he is the, the VP nominee, he will do nothing to attract Hispanic voters to the Republican Party because Marco Rubio is on exactly the opposite side of every single issue that Latinos care about, starting from the economy to education to immigration. He's against comprehensive immigration reform. He's against a legalized path for for uh, undocumented immigrants. He's against the DREAM Act, even though he supported it once, and, and, and when he got flack for it from the Tea Party, he flip-flopped <clears throat> and is now against it. And uh, Bill's absolutely right. Mexican Americans do not view Cuban Americans as being able to understand the plight of most Latino voters, and Mexican, Amer Mexican Americans make up 70% of the Latino voters in this country. Cubans, they believe Cubans do not understand their plight because of the wet foot, dry foot policy and, and it is a real divide. And the other thing is that even Cuban Americans in Florida, that electorate is changing. They are becoming much more um, liberal, if you will. Um, their grandparents, who were the hardliners against Fidel Castro, are frankly dying off. And so the hardline Cuban Republican vote is diminishing, whereas the younger, more economically oriented Cuban American vote is uh, basically looking at Democrats as the ones who are going to be able to open up Cuba and they'll be able to go back to, to their country of, that their descendants came from, and that is something that, that they look forward to. But the other point why I think this is critically important, and, and actually I'll mention another, <clears throat> another possibility that I do think 
would be, and I sort of don't want to say this, but I do think would be would make Democrats more vulnerable is if he chose somebody like Susanna Martinez. Because Susanna Martinez's grandparents were, she's of Mexican descent, Susanna Martinez's grandparents were, were undocumented immigrants. And she is somebody who will be very credible to Latinos in a way that Marco Rubio will never be. But I do want to mention that it, it is a real problem for the GOP right now in terms of the Latino vote. And it is a real problem, the hardline anti-immigrant rhetoric that they have all adopted, starting from Michelle Bachman talking about anchor babies to Herman Cain joking about the electrified fence on the border. I mean, it really has been atrocious, the kind of language that these candidates have thrown about. And Latinos will remember. And no candidate, well, no GOP candidate can get to the White House, and, and this is a Republican pollster who has said this time and again, Matthew Dowd, without at least 40% of the Hispanic vote. These Republican candidates, none of them are breaking 22% right now, and I think that is a real problem, and what the, whatever they say now is going to come back to haunt them in the general. All right, excellent. <clears throat> uh, Alex, who are we forgetting? as Mitt Romney's vice president. Um, I don't know that we're forgetting any any uh, specific names, although I'd throw out uh, Brian Sandoval in, in Nevada as just another, another Hispanic. Hispanic governor. Uh, but one thing I would just add on the, on the Rubio note, we are all sort of talking about why he would choose somebody other than Rubio, right? We haven't, uh, we sort of take for granted that Rubio is an enormously compelling candidate on his own, and I think that that's, that's mostly true. Um, but one thing I would just note as a just point of caution there in, in thinking about a Romney-Rubio ticket, the case Romney has been making against the president and that he clearly wants to make against the president uh, is that the president uh, didn't understand the job, wasn't up to the job, didn't <coughs> understand the economy, and that he is going to be the competent, uh, economy savvy replacement for a very misguided choice in the White House. If that's your message, I'm not sure that choosing a freshman senator just a couple years out of the Florida State Legislature is going to reinforce that in a positive way. It may be that Romney is more concerned about balancing his ticket uh, and reaching out to some Latino voters if, if that might uh, <laughs> by some chance work. Um, but I, I think it's very, very plausible to see him trying to go with sort of the Clinton-Gore uh, model of choosing somebody who reinforces his strengths rather than balances them and goes with somebody like uh, McDonnell, as, as Ed suggested, or, or, or even uh, Rob Portman with his super committee baggage. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a, that's a very good point. Now, next question. We're, we're getting into the spring, and that's when third party and independent candidates announce. You, I know you don't know the names because we don't know the names, you know, unless it's Donald Trump again. But who, uh, what faction will run? Somebody's going to run, inevitably, as a third-party candidate. Maybe they'll be significant. Maybe they'll be insignificant. Maybe it'll be more than one. Will it be a Tea Party person? Will it be somebody from the left who continue not challenging him in the uh, Obama in the primary, but continuing to be unhappy with Obama's performance on health care, this and that? Will it be a centrist through this Americans elect group? Who's going to who's going to fill that third party slot, pro or otherwise? Not a, well, uh, the, not the not pro, but a pro. I think you and I have had this conversation, but the obvious answer is Ron Paul. That Ron Paul, if he doesn't win the Republican nomination, has an organization, a long-standing organization. He has a long-standing uh, fundraising apparatus in place. Um, and, you know, this is his last rodeo. I mean, he's not running for his seat. Uh, he's 74 years old. Um, the only negative would be it would damage his son, uh, Senator Rand Paul, with the party. But other than that, it's hard to imagine that Ron Paul would look <coughs> at uh, Governor Romney and say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm... 100% with, with, with him. And that would hurt Romney, right? Oh, it would yeah. hurt Republican. Whoever the Republican is, I think uh, that Ron Paul's votes would come from the Republican nominee. Here's a surprise. Ron Paul has already done that. He ran as an independent in 1988. Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers. I don't even know if he remembers. <laughs> but in 1988, in 1988, Ron Paul was the Libertarian Party candidate for president. He got less than half a percent of the vote. But he's done it. I, I believe that Ron Paul feels very strongly he's not going to run. Um, I think that was his commitment. I think he, the reason why he announced he wasn't running for re-election is he plans on staying in this all the way through. 
I think you can expect him to get somewhere in the 8, 9, 10% range of every primary that he's in because that's basically what his base is. It has disappeared a little bit with Kane, but it's now come roaring back, but leveled off at that 10% uh, level. I mean, my answer would be that if they don't have a hell of a lot of money, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, that, that, you know, people forget that, uh, that H. Ross Perot got out of the race in 1992 because his consultants at that time kind of drove home to him at what level of spending he would have to spend at in order to make it all the way through the campaign. Um, what no one kind of understood and what he did is he got out of the race and then got back in when he was willing to get in and spend at that level for the rest of the campaign. Um, he, he's much smarter than people give him credit for. Um, uh, and he got 19% in, in, in that election. But he got it because he spent, quite frankly, as much as both the Republican and the Democrat combined in that election. So if you don't have a stack of money, it almost doesn't matter whether you get in as an independent. All right, go ahead, Maria. I, I'm, I wouldn't put it past Sarah Palin to flirt with it. And, uh, and, and especially if Romney is the nominee, because I think that she can then say, you know, that the Tea Party movement interests are not being represented, that, you know, the folks who were so excited and put Republicans in power in 2010 are not being represented. I don't think she'll actually do it because it's sort of her MO. But can you imagine <laughs> the, the, the attention that she would get? She's got money. The attention that she would get if she even said that she was thinking about doing this. And she's all about getting that kind of attention. So I wouldn't put it past her to, f to flirt with it, but I don't actually think she would do it. And other than that, other than her, I don't really see anybody else. Alex, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, Politico did this sort of uh, uh, parlor game exercise about a month ago uh, where we invited our readers to nominate people to run as an independent candidate and then had them vote on who would be the most compelling one. And it, we did not come up with a particularly compelling list of candidates uh, for that role. Uh, one of them was John Huntsman, another one, one of them uh, was Hillary. Erskine Bowles. Um, Hillary. Hillary Clinton would be obviously very compelling, but mm. that's not going to happen. Um, I just think that, that so so often the folks who are sort of dreaming about this independent uh, presidential candidate are thinking about somebody like Michael Bloomberg or a John Huntsman who really don't speak to, at least as far as I can tell, anything that Mitt Romney and Barack Obama don't speak to on some level themselves. That uh, if you have two candidates, you know, one of whom went to Harvard Law, the other one went to Harvard uh, Law and Harvard Business School, one of whom uh, came up through a state legislature in the U.S. Senate, the other went into the financial services industry and then had a sort of conventional Republican in Massachusetts political career. Uh, I don't know that throwing in one more sort of Ivy League, uh, cautious, uh, pretty conventional politician who is trying to run to the middle changes the calculus that much. So I think unless someone like Ron, uh, excuse me, Ron Paul or Rand Paul, uh, who really does speak to um, a totally different set of voters and a totally different degree of frustration with Washington. Um, I, I think if there were someone who, who was willing to fill, fill that role, I do wonder whether money would be less of an obstacle than it's been in the past, because I think all of us in the media would be uh, thrilled to give um, virtually unlimited coverage to uh, <laughs> anyone playing that outsider role, but I don't know who that person would be. Uh, Bill, I, I know you've been following the American Select Group. What do you think the uh, the Tom Friedman encouraged oh. group that you know is nominating a Democrat for president or a Republican and then matching it with a vice president from the other party, um, and they're doing it by internet. And this it's never been done this way before. And I'd just be interested to know what you or other panelists think about it. Does it have any any chance of ha really happening and changing the election results? Well, I get. Americans elect and no labels kind of confused. They're separate, I think. Uh, but they do express. A lot of common members. Common members. Yeah. Uh, these are two different movements to try to hold the center together. Let me remind you of something. We have had four presidents in a row who got elected on a pledge to bring the country together. They all failed. The first President Bush said he was for a kinder, gentler America. He lasted one term. Bill Clinton was a new Democrat in the third way. Uh, he ended up uh, with a country bitterly divided. George W. Bush pledged the very day he declared for president in November 1999 in Austin, Texas, that he was going to be a uniter, not a divider. We saw what happened to that. 
And President, oh, well then Senator Obama uh, said there is no red America, there is no blue America, there's only the United States of America, and the countries ended up even more divided. One after the other, they all failed. It's, there's a great longing in this country for the country to pull together. I used to say it would take a great national trauma. We had one! On 9-11, and for one year the country was united, one year, until September 2002 when the Bush administration began the rollout of the Iraq war. Uh, there is a longing for it, and there are groups out there like American Select, uh, the No Labels, which are expressing that. If there were a Ross Perot with that kind of money, there might be some votes out there. But the bottom line in this is the same as the bottom line in all of our politics. <clears throat> you can't win the horse race without a horse. Uh, and at the moment, the Tea Party doesn't have a horse. They're trying different ones, but they don't have a horse, which is why the great irony is, in a party that's supposed to have been taken over by the Tea Party, they may nominate someone the Tea Party doesn't like, Mitt Romney. Um, they don't have a horse. Uh, Occupy Wall Street doesn't have a candidate. And they might have run someone, someone against Obama. They don't like Obama. Uh, the, these third party movements, they don't have anyone. They don't have a candidate. That's how our politics works. You've got to have a candidate. If you want to run as a third party, you've got to have a candidate with some money or organization behind him or her. The only possibility which I th thought would be, might happen, but I don't think it will because it's getting late. There are some political consultants out there who work with various factions of the Tea Party movement who may be tempted to run a third party or independent candidate. It will not be Sarah Palin, it will not be anyone who wants to have a serious future in the Republican Party because you run as a third party candidate, you're immediately, you immediately become Pat Buchanan. Uh, but I think there are some consultants who see this as a way to make money. If they run an independent Tea Party candidate, whoever it is, it could be anybody, uh, Herman Cain, Alan West, just somebody to show the Tea Party's displeasure with Mitt Romney, uh, they may be able to raise some money and there are probably some consultants who are making that calculation right now. And Bill, by, by the way, that out. I wouldn't rule that out. If, if you want to know who that group, look for the one group that raises money to themselves saying they'll spend it for the candidate if you want to know who that group is. <laughs> We won't, we won't define it any further. No one wants to be sued. Let me, uh, let me throw open uh, to the audience uh, for some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, welcome back. I'm delighted to see you. Wahoo wah. Um, I don't know if you covered this already. Did you guys examine the role of the Commonwealth in the 2012? Condoleezza Rice running as an independent for president? No, 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 no. 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 Uh, uh, Romney's, uh, oh, as Romney's VP. Oh, that's interesting. Anybody think that's a possibility, or is she fully retired and happy at Stanford? She ruled it out. So, yeah, well, I mean, but, you know, that that's matter. what they say. And, you know, <laughs> I, 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 tend to, I tend to believe her, though. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think there would be a lot of people. Sorry. I tend, I tend to believe her at her word. She has said in, in many interviews that this is not what she wants. She did her eight years. She wrote her book. Um, I, I actually, as a Democrat, I admire her greatly. She's so classy, and I, I really do tend to believe, believe her at her word. She's got a great gig, and, um, and, I, and I don't think she'll change her mind. Iraq, Iraq, uh, Iraq. I think differently. <laughs> you want to introduce the Iraq war into the campaign and bring all that back? Mm. With Condoleezza right. Rice on yeah. the ticket. That is a problem. Let, let, let me just mention one thing as a premise. Uh, there, there's a lot of myth about the 2008 election. Um, uh, the youth <laughs> vote accounted for six of the seven points um, that, uh, that McCain lost the election by when you compare it to where they were voting just eight years earlier. Um, but the myth about a whole different group of people coming out to vote is just that. Turnout in 2008 was only two-tenths of a percent higher than it was four years earlier. There is not one, one uh, uh, sp special group, special interest group, whatever you want to call it, um, that voted more than a percent more than they had, or a percent less than they had 
four years earlier. Um, the, the movement, the, the loss of the vote came from a true movement of the youth vote where they went from voting for, for, for Bush by 1% in 2000, voting against him by 11 points in 2004, and voted against McCain by 34 points as they were growing from 16 to 17 to 18% of the votes cast. It was, a, it was a shift of the vote as opposed to new vote coming mm -hmm. out. Um, and it's something that I've tried to drive home with the Republicans, but more importantly as a pollster, one of the things I think we did very wrong in the 2008 campaign is we were pulling sample based on what we thought the electorate was going to be instead of pulling sample based on traditionally what we knew on how to pull samples. And that's why very often there was kind of a miscue on where the race was and what was really happening. Um, the one thing that we know from kind of looking at campaigns is there's three groups of voters. There's Republicans, there's Democrats, and there's Independents. The, the <coughs> issue in a presidential year is the same as a non-presidential year. What is the intensity difference between Democrats and Republicans? The biggest unknown in any campaign is those independent voters. Mm -hmm. And the one constant we see with those independent voters is it's the angry independents who turn out to vote in the presidential year. That's why there's the push. And so that's going to dictate a lot of what the two campaigns are saying to get their vote. And it also means that you can pretty much look at the environment and have, an, have a fairly good feel that the group of independents who are going to vote in this year's election are going to be very different than the group of uh, independent voters who voted in the 2008 election. We're almost out of time for this panel. Let me get a couple of quick questions and quick answers. Emily? Going back to the vice president race, as someone who was a proud member of the Virginia Senate way back when the, this election last week split the Virginia Senate 2020, and a very conservative uh, Republican got elected and already is making waves about all these kinds of Mississippi-type uh, legislation he's going to introduce. Now, we've got McDonald, who's going to have to sort of moderate these Republicans in the Senate, and either he's going to have to go very, very conservative, or he's going to have to go more moderate. So won't this hurt his <coughs> chances to be vice president? And yes, I know he wants to be vice president. And he has one of the staff members talk to me and email me. He really wants to be <laughs> vice president. But isn't the Senate election and the fact that Virginia is now run by Republicans going to hurt him? Because he's going to have to make some real decisions. If he mishandles it, yes. If he doesn't mishandle it, no. Simple as that. But I do think you bring up a, I, I think you bring up a very, very critical point, which is, and and we probably don't have time for in-depth discussion about this, but it, it, it reminds me of what happened in Ohio. Um, it reminds me of the recall. I think Juan was talking about this earlier, which is. There's a real overreach that's happening on behalf of Republicans around the country. And they need to be really careful about where they go this next year because independents, going to Ed's point, they are the, 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 the ones to win. They don't want extremes, any extreme. They want leaders who are actually going to work together to find solutions to what we're facing right now. And that's why I think the Tea Party can be detrimental to Republicans. The Tea Party movement can be detrimental to Republicans because even though they might seem favorable to 40% of the electorate, their unfavorability ratings have skyrocketed, especially over the summer. And I think Republicans need to be very careful about that, especially in the states and in terms of what's going on in the governorships, but I think also at the national level. And that's why I think you're also seeing these negotiations on the super committee where, well, I don't think Republicans are where they need to be, but they are finally talking about revenues where the Tea Party, along with Grover Norquist, from the very beginning were very hardline about the, there cannot be any new revenues. It's got to be all just cutting spending. So Two, th two things real quick, because uh, I know the Democratic line is to p call attention to what happened in, in Mississippi on the personhood and to call attention to what happened in Ohio. It's not the, the line, kind of, it's what happened. The, the kind of, the, but the missed story in Ohio 
is in fact two things. One is that the unions were very smart in getting the no position, uh, number one, and I'll come back to that in a second. But number two, there was an, a, a stop Obama health care mandate bill also on the ballot in Ohio, which received 180,000 more votes than the union position on election day. And so as much as it's portrayed as Republicans going too far, that's not the case. One of the things we know from a polling standpoint is that there is a uniqueness to, there's kind of a, an art to doing initiatives. Um, you want the no position. Because what happens in initiatives is that if you, if you have any confusion of the voters on what that initiative is all about, they vote no. And so in Ohio, they got the no position, so they weren't in danger of that, and they ran a campaign that was very aggressive and outspent the other side by seven to one. But the personhood issue was extremely confusing in terms of the vote. If the vote had have been in, in, in Mississippi, conception starts, uh, life starts at conception, it would have been a much different turnout than this kind of strange wording that they had of the bill that quite frankly, including the governor of the state, walked into the election saying, this is very confusing and some problems with it because of how confusing it is. We knew, and I was watching the polling because I was doing the governor's race, we watched that initiative go from 69 to 63 to 58 to 52% in the last, last four weeks, and we knew it was going down. Not because we were showing a majority, but because we weren't showing 60%. All right, that's very interesting. Let, let me get one more quick question, and then we've got to move on to the next panel. I apologize. Sir, maybe you can come up and grab the panelists as they're leading. Just don't let them go. You can just, you know, tackle them. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Thank you. I, I was curious to know what, you, what your feelings are. Um, how do the new form of media or entertainment um, like some of the Citizens United films, how do they impact um, the, the election, or have they at all? But even Sarah Palin's film, uh, does that really impact the, the election? Or, uh, the super PACs? Yeah, well, just, just the different films that have come out. And that's, uh, how, I'm just curious to know how they've impacted uh, the uh, actual election, or have they at all? I don't think the films have um, in and of themselves because I think what you're seeing about those films is that they're talking, they are really only talking to, they're preaching to the choir. They're not going to convince anybody on the other side, really. But you bring up a good point, which is what I think is impacting this election is new media and social media. Because we are living every single moment 24-7, and that's why I, th I think things that have happened in the debate, like Perry's oops and you know <laughs> everything else, Herman Cain's Libya moment, it, it, it probably would not have been as bad 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. But we are living it every single second of every single day. And so that really puts the onus, and it's a huge challenge for all of us who are advisors and who work on campaigns, we have to know how to respond to that. And we have to know how to deal with it. We have to know how to mitigate it. Um, and, and that, you know, crisis communications is a whole new world today. Like absolutely, absolutely, than it was five years ago. But I also want to make a very quick point, and something that, that Bill brought up. We say, uh, Americans say that they want th somebody to bring them together, but do we really? Because if that was the case, then I don't think you would have Fox News with skyrocketing ratings and you would have MSNBC with skyrocketing ratings. And, and, and what you see also with you know, the whole new media and social media and a gazillion websites on the left and the right is that people are going to news sources that underscore what they already know and believe. They're not really going to news sources to find out, you know, to, f to get more information, to find out about an additional opinion, to become more informed, to see if maybe, you know, they, they're going to change their positions. It seems to me that all of this has really led to people basically digging in. And that's why I think that you have, that it's part of the reason, it's not, you know, the whole reason, but I think it's part of the reason that has um, really gone to the fact that we are such a divided country. I think the, the, the new media and the social media and you know the fact that everybody has a voice which is terrific but I think it really has led to people basically underscoring their own opinions all right I hate to bring this to a close there are more questions but we have to have a snack
and refreshments for 15 minutes. But please join me in thanking this terrific panel. They did a great job.